With just 54 days to Ghana's critical December elections, the nation grapples with the pressing issues of illegal mining, rising cost of living, and intense political rivalry. Amidst these challenges, the call for a credible and peaceful election has never been more urgent. In this special edition of Hot Issues, we examine these calls and explore whether Ghana is on the right path to a peaceful transition or on the brink of electoral unrest, as some have predicted. I am Kemeni Amano, and today I sit with a distinguished guest with the experience and the moral authority to speak on peace building. He was the first chairperson of Ghana's National Peace Council, playing a pivotal role in diffusing the tensions of the 2008 elections. His influence has since extended far beyond Ghana's borders as he continues to be a global peace advocate. He is one of few Africans to serve alongside the Pope at the Vatican. My guest is the Chancellor of the Pontifical Academies of Sciences and Social Sciences at the Vatican, His Eminence Cardinal Peter Apia Texan. We caught up with him at the Ghana Speaks event here in Accra. One of the things you've spoken about today is why we are still talking about peace building in the lead up to an election 14 years after you left this country and did a similar thing. Why did that surprise you? <laughs> so probably because you know, there should be growth in every process. We start somewhere, but we should aim at getting somewhere. And uh, when we started, one might say that we were still making an experiment with, an, you know, with a political system that was not there before. Mm -hmm. Because we did have a, you know, a kind of form of a democratic dispensation, which can again be contested. The days of Kwame Nkrumah, right? right. It started democratically, and then it became you know, one party state and so on. So, immediately, you know, recent part is what Rollins. Mm -hmm. Okay, when from a military coup, he was encouraged to metamorphose into some you know, democratic uh, system Indeed. with himself as the head of state. And then there was a talk at that time of handing over power. And I remember him saying, the hand over power to whom? Okay, yeah, and, and but happily, he did hand over, became president, and then so this, this we talk about the 1992 constitution and all. Mm -hmm. And so one might say that that was some kind of a beginning. And then, you know, a change of government comes and all of that. But, you know, this process doesn't necessarily have to show the acrimony and the hostility and the violence that, 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 that sometimes accompanies. That, that, is the, that is the surprise. I mean, one might say that at the beginning we didn't quite know where we were going, so there was this struggle and all of that. I must it continue and be the pattern of the day. Mm -hmm. From what you hear from, uh, you know, Professor, you know, what's his name? Uh, Aquatis, right. you know, whatever thing. It becomes vigilante. Vigilante against whom? I see, so the thing for me, what, what, what I find a little bit disturbing mm -hmm. is parties arrogating to themselves something which doesn't belong to them. You, uh, you are a political party. You're only supposed to present to the electorate your option. You sell your goods, and you allow the you know, electorate to appreciate your goods, and so elect you. What could they be arrogating to themselves? If what they're arrogating to themselves is that you know, making, they're constitu making a government, mm. constituting a government, okay? To, to as if, you know, uh, it's there. You know, otherwise, it's no democracy. Mm -hmm. they, you allow a people to choose the leaders they want. And if you think that they should choose you, then you have to sell your products. You have to, so that's what manifestos sometimes are supposed to do. Indeed. But when you have multiple manifestos, then there must be, you know, if you have to choose between going to Accra by road or by train, then there should be somebody to give you the advantages of going by train or by road. Right. And that's what I refer to as a national vision. Indeed. We need to get here. This one says through this one, another way says it. But without the national vision, how do we choose between two options? We've, we've tried that before. Uh, we had the 40-year plan, hoping that we would build... 40 year, so, so the 40-year plan you describe as the national vision. Mm -hmm. Was that the Is national vision? No, I, I, would probably, I would probably would have had something that goes back to the motto we have at independence. If freedom and justice is the term, 
That should be what should be formulated ultimately as the vision for Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. We're aiming at a land where all will be free and all will live in a full experience of justice. That's where that is. So if the 40 year plan, you know, teases this out mm -hmm. and enables us to pursue a path that leads us to that, that is whatever. So if any party comes and it comes with this product, my thing is to about how that gets me there. Mm -hmm. This should be considered more serious because we have the phenomenon of a change of party and a lot of projects left halfway uncompleted. And the new party that comes doesn't think it's its responsibility to bring to completion something that somebody else has started. But if what somebody else has started is in line with the national vision and plan, you have no problem continuing it. Mm. So it's so important, we need, we, need to, we need to fashion and craft for ourselves a kind of an ethic mm. that enables us to, accept, to have a sense, sense of responsibility, right. exercise concern for one. It's and, a, and, and here we are, right? Uh, we do not have that national vision. We're going into an elections. Uh, from where manifestos you become the national vision. It would appear and so. so. Yeah, it would appear so. There's no choice. So, and, and when and when that party is out of power, what happens to the manifesto? It goes away with the party. So what? There's no continuity. Then you know, there's no growth. Hmm. And that is our bane, isn't it? That, that, that I, I, I'm not happy with that. <laughs> so, you know, mm. I wish, I wish, you know, I wish there's, a, you know, we grow. You know, you build on what, what somebody else has done. Mm. And the way, and the way we do party, you know, party say that, you know, the, 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 the climate of animosity so per se prevails that what somebody has touched, you don't think, you know, it's up to you to continue. Mm. If even continuing, that will be of great benefit to a village or whatever type of thing. I see. I ran through Eastern Region right after the last uh, whatever. And all the projects have completed. Gathering weeds and gathering. Who has to do it? The, pre, the, the, the chiefs or whatever, some community activity? I don't know. But we need to, we need to, we need to see our, 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 we need to kind of understand our responsibility towards the common good in a, in a, in a more clearer way than than we, we are right now, done, right. indeed. By what standards should the Ghanaian voter now choose the next government? What do you expect to see? By what standard? Yes. Be go, because wonder, we do not have that national Right, so, so that's what I was yesterday. I wonder what I know. I wonder what I, what I, see, like, what is it? There's a lack of, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. Indeed. So I used to be Archbishop of Cape Coast. So Cape Coast, whatever, election comes, and you hear women say, yeah, if you have some boy and pay school. This when uh, a party went and said promises school free, SS, whatever. And people say, yeah, if you have some boy and pay school. What a vision of life. Mm -hmm. If you have some boy to carry your fish mm -hmm. and pay school for Umba, uh, for, for, for your children, whatever. So we need a lot of education. You know, and, and it just appears also as if short term vision of terms. So it takes control over our psyche and everything that. Get something. If even they give you a sample with 50 CDs inside there, you think that they've done you a favor. How long do you spend 50 CDs? It's a meal for a day. Mm -hmm. But that short-term vision is such that, you know, we also have the proverb, right? Is it the data? Yes, it is the preoccupy. Okay, but, but that, doesn't, that doesn't translate into any reality for us when we need to make crucial, you know, lifelong decisions. Mm -hmm. and. That's probably where I, I, I will not put it beyond the church or the mosque or whatever. Education to help people appreciate the values they need to look at when they go to vote for mm, anything. I see. I mean, so, you know, essentially, as a people, we, sh we should start to look at the bigger picture than we what we get in the we immediate. If, if, even the problem now that is being fought over about the environmental or calamity or whatever type of it's a question of a vision. Mm. Well, the short-term vision, you get some gold now, or whatever you get, and then, and then what happens to your children who come? They come living in barren land. Ghana was not a barren land. Mm -hmm. Why should we make it a barren land for, unless we do not believe in the future? Mm -hmm. But if we have children now, then we necessarily must believe in the future tomorrow when they are future. And you cannot leave them a wilderness when you got a place as a garden. But the blame has largely been put at the doorstep of the government. Do you agree with that? You know, I, 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 I have not had the data mm -hmm. to put at the doorsteps, but, but the government in the sense that 
it has got the over general oversight of the country. So if something is happening in the country which is not conducive to the well-being of the country, that the government should say stop or control that. In that sense, right? In that sense of uh, having this, we have an executive presidency. Okay, it has the executive powers to do it. In that sense, you know, I will grab but in the sense of you see the one behind those who are excavating and digging and all of that, that that I you know, but in the sense of general oversight of what is good for the country and all of that, somebody must take responsibility. And the ultimate person to take responsibility is the one who exercises government and rule Indeed. over this land. Has the clergy played this role well in this education you ask about? It's uh, some, you know, uh, even, even within, okay, so, uh, even within the Christian church, mm -hmm. The Orthodox Church, that's the Greek Orthodox Church, has been far more is has been sensitive to this ecological issue way before the Western Catholic, you know, whatever churches. Okay, we coming on board relatively compared with the Orthodox Church. Because they used to have a celebration of creation or every September first day of September, for them was a day uh, of prayer for creation, celebrating creation. We came in late, but we've recognized it and we're on board now. And through this document I referred to that the Pope wrote, Care for Our Common Home, uh, whatever, other religious groups have come on. In Turkey, uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, there was a group that brought Muslim leaders together to tag on to this ecological. So I think it's become a big religious movement now to take care of creation and all. Mm. What I refer to out there as the ecocide, in the initiative for the ecocide law, that was coming from the church in Sweden. Okay, so people have become very sensitive to the issue. And in a way, it's not purely because of scientific thing about you know, climate change and all of that and that. But at a certain point, for religious groups, it's also a religious issue. If you really believe in a God creator, then you do not want to abuse mm -hmm. what your God creator has you know, created. And he gave you the earth as a garden. Why turn it into a wilderness for your children? Right. It's so, and a lot of things don't gel if you put the two together then, you know? uh, Locally, we know that the Catholic Bishops' Conference has chosen to go yeah. on a march. Is prayer what we need now? Uh, when you talk in, 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 uh, in place of force, when you want to have somebody do something which is not used to doing, you either persuade or you force him. Okay, and when they talk about prayer, then they talk about their, this other option of persuading or helping somebody to see something. So that's what, you, if you don't want to force the person, mm -hmm. then you just pray for a conversion, change of mind or whatever, and that's what prayer does. Mm -hmm. So in this regard, from our own office, okay, uh, which used to promote this document and ecology, travel all the world over to talk about this, that's what, that's what you find. You know, a lot of people first do not believe that there's really the need mm -hmm. for this concern or are not convinced about it. So some true arguments you can get to them to see the point, but some also who are not who are adamant, sometimes you know you just have to just pray for them. Mm. That they, they they say so prayer. That's I mean, for Christians you don't have any powerful way of doing anything beside prayer. Mm. I mean, I was going to ask if the church could do much more than prayer. Like what? Okay, apart from prayer, mm -hmm. or oh, it will be to back your prayer with concrete initiatives. Mm -hmm. For example, so you do your march, and then let's say you decide to put some acres outside uh, Accra right. on the trees, and you do a tree planting campaign and all of that. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, something of this has always been there. I mean, you know, uh, as a child growing up in school, I remember that the first days of June, we used to be referred to as Abba Day, mm -hmm. the day of the week. And that was just, I think this is from colonial or whatever, and it's a day that encouraged planting of trees. So that culture has been there, it's been overlooked, but I think beside prayer, bishops and local churches can take a concrete project of putting some space of land on the trees. Mm. I see. While we're on the subject of uh, illegal mining, I read your contribution to the Catholic Peace Building and uh, Mining Booklet. Um, you had talked about the biblical placement of all these precious 
uh, minerals that we, <laughs> we, we are clamoring for. Yeah, that, is, that is, yeah. Uh, as so that is, yeah, that's a book that was done out of Notre Dame, I think. Indeed. Yeah. And, and, and then you had questioned why we have now, you know, alienated ourselves from the very gifts that we should have to prosper our lives. And today we are living that in this country. Mm. We have talked about what we could be doing, but why is it important that we begin to look at this perhaps from that angle? No, uh, I mean, if, if one believes or one is of the opinion that the world is the work of creation, then it means it corresponds to a design. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it, was a, it, to, it corresponds to a purpose. Then there's some, something that was done for a purpose, with a purpose and with a design. And if there's any design behind this, then that is what should guide how we treat, okay, creation. Mm -hmm. If we are an evolutionist, who just think that things, you know, grew out of a single molecule, became multiple molecules and all of that and that, then probably that thing about chance is that thing. But if we do not attribute things to chance, but believe in a creator God, then we need to affirm that thing of a design. Why did he make it this way? Why did God create whatever he created this way and all of that? In which case, in which case you find some indicators in the Bible, some of which are, you know, I, I quoted. For example, the book of Job, chapter 28, okay, compares that thing about, you know, search for treasures to search for wisdom. Okay, and talks about the mining experience. People know how to go deep, stop canals, stop whatever, to look for treasure. And say, but who knows the path to wisdom? You can find treasure, minerals and whatever, but that's... That's not get you close to finding true wisdom. With, with what we see today, have we found a path to that's, wisdom? That's the point. We've not found wisdom. We haven't. We've not found wisdom. We, we, we've kind of engrossed by the, the manifestations of this. But true wisdom will teach us to kind of establish a balance. Mm. We, you know, so we need a world. Mm. So God put all of this at our disposal, universal good of the earth, put all of this at our disposal. But its use must be said that you know, uh, it doesn't exhaust, because everything created is exhaustible. If everything created is exhaustible, then it's up to us to establish a time, when must it stop Indeed. supporting human life? Mm -hmm. It's up to us to determine that. And if we use it as if it's inexhaustible, then we're making a mistake. Indeed. Wisdom is not prevailed. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is not guiding our path towards the use of the you know, finite mm -hmm. resources, treating them as if they're infinite. Indeed, indeed. And you'd think that perhaps that is where the church could, you know, step in. Because a lot of people, a lot of these people who uh, are in the mining sector, we could assume are Christians. But the church has failed so. on this job, <laughs> or on, that, on, that, on that score, to ensure that, you know, these people are led in the path of wisdom when it comes to dealing with our minerals. So just that they have one other challenge. Mm. The one other challenge is dealing with poverty. Mm. Okay, so one, the other challenge is dealing with poverty. And I have dealt with this elsewhere in some other situations. Uh, because, uh, because poverty is an issue to look at. And I suppose those who go, if you were to ask any of these guys in Kalam, say they probably say, otherwise they have no money. Or they have no whatever, whatever type of thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question then of, uh, of uh, if now we're focusing on the church, there's a question then of helping them develop alternative access to this. Mm. And when you talk about alternative development, this is something that for since 2012, from our office in Rome, we've been talking with because we had a meeting with Sea of Mining Companies. And we tell them to develop alternative industries. It means what? You mining gold here. If tomorrow the gold mines are uh, exhausted, are you going to leave a ghost town? So we say, while you mining this, have the community to develop an alternative industry so that when this, you know, is all exhausted and all, the community will not collapse, they will have this alternative industry. So this is something that we've advised and offered to a lot of Sea of Gold and my Gold uh, uh, Mining Company. Newmont has been part of this movement. I see. Uh, Anglo Gold, whatever, attend this movement. 
I don't know whether you heard of the name Kutifani before. Mm. He was a judge of Anglo Gold, you know, South Africa. So, but, we, but these are big names. Perhaps so, we should so start right. to so rope in the smaller ones as well. Yeah. Huh? I'm saying these are big names. Should we start to rope in the, you know, the smaller mining companies as well? So, so this is the thing. So, uh, the smaller mining company, the more we so uh, we look for the names. Mm -hmm. This smaller whatever type of thing, probably if. I don't know, probably we've not looked closely enough to get the small ones. Mm -hmm. But the group we used to get right on the, on the, on the ground on the ground was, I bet you have the group called Wacom before? I have. Okay. So Wacom used to attend meetings with us in Rome. Mm, okay, they came as communities affected by mining. Mm. So they came as the, as the victim, you know, those suffering from mining and whatever. I wonder... This is, I mean, I know, about 10 or so years. I wonder what has happened to Wacom now. Mm. And with all of this, I'm saying potholes all over, I wonder what they now feel and think. Mm. But, you know, so I've lost touch with them. I've in any way changed office also. Absolutely. I've now moved to the academy. And, but, so that's something that we can do. But poverty is the one that compromises sometimes the application of these virtues and wisdom. The way this country is going, mm -hmm. as far as illegal and unethical mining, uh, you know, are concerned, your country of birth. Mm -hmm. What's your biggest fear? The way we are going. Go one step further. Not only my country, but I was born in a mining town. Mm -hmm. You heard of in Suta was so absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we call ourselves mine speakings, Okay. These are people who were born in a mining, whatever town. Or, so, okay. So that's uh, the country, my country of whatever. Where is it going? Where well, is I mean, it? what's your biggest fear about, about where we are headed if the status quo remains? If the, if the status quo remains, we'll get, we'll get to a stage, to put it bluntly, a failed state. Because, I mean, we've depended on cocoa production. We are basically an economy that was based on mines and agriculture. Kwame Nkrumah, in his wisdom, asked miners to go down and get the mineral and leave the surface for farming for us to feed on. That wisdom has been lost. We, we're now going down to get the mineral. We're now getting on the surface. So taking the vegetation, taking the topsoil, and then leaving potholes. It's, 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 you know, he had a vision which, according to him, was a little bit more, far more correct than the person, whatever. So the, if we go this way, we lose our vegetation, and the era of climate change, you don't want to lose your vegetation. We lose our topsoil, and food production is an issue. Mm -hmm. I should have been in FAO this morning in Rome to talk about food shortage crisis. Okay? There's food shortage crisis in the world all over. Okay? And why, <laughs> why should we be destroying topsoil? You know, from, 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 from which we live. Mm -hmm. and, and then in search of gold, which you cannot eat. It gives you capacity to buy something. But unless you have food to buy, your gold is useless. Mm. And where does it go? Dubai. Speaking you go to the airport in Dubai, it's all, it's all out there. Where is it from? When we, I was a child growing up in the mines, you had goldsmiths in every corner, and Ghanaians could decorate themselves with the gold that is produced in Ghana. Where do you find them now? Speaking of that, where do you find them now? Is it also the case that the global market for these precious minerals like gold have failed the countries of origin because they do not really care where it's coming from? That is true, especially with some other minerals. Okay, lithium and stuff for you know, batteries and computer, whatever type of thing. But gold mining is, is, is so, it so begins in such a you know, it's a, such a local level. Mm -hmm. You know, lithium and all of that, you need big industries to go to get blast whatever rocks. Kalamse, everybody gets a, or you can, even with a pickaxe and whatever, you can, you can begin to dig whatever type of thing. So, so what, 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 what has happened? What has happened is that the interest has just been acquired the gold. At what cost? I told you I grew up, I was born in, in Suta. The big town next to Suta is Tapwa. Mm -hmm. My niece tells me if he was not in university, he would be trading in pineapples. What does that mean? The cost of a pineapple, a tube of pineapple in Tapwa, is 10 times what you buy on the road in Cape Coast. 
So she thinks that if, you know, if she did a commerce in you know, taking pineapple to Takwa, because Takwa is lost its topsoil. Okay, cost of living in Takwa is sky, you know, sky high. Sky, I mean, skyrocketing. Where, 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 where does the food has to be brought in? Mm, indeed. And so, I mean, it's, it takes a little bit of, we have wealth that we need to explore. And we need a little bit of wisdom to be able to create a balance between what we get and what we feed on. Your Eminence, we'll take a quick break. When sure. we come back, we'll tackle a few issues around the illegal mining menace, but also we'll talk <laughs> about the elections. You're watching Hot Issues, don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching a special edition of Hot Issues. My guest is His Eminence, Cardinal Peter Kojo Apia Texan. Again, thank you so much for sitting with us on Thanks. the program. Yeah. Um, one of the things you said at the event is uh, the fact that, you know, Pope Francis is somebody who's championed not only the protection of young people, but also ensuring that young people are ahead. Mm -hmm. And you expect that the, th the people you refer to as the three protagonists, mm -hmm. you know, are able to carry that forward as well. They should. <laughs> they should, shouldn't they? <laughs> But, yes, but here we are in this country, while we're on the subject of Galamse, young people poured out onto the streets, wanting their voices to be heard to ensure that, look, there is an end to illegal and unethical mining in this country. You know what happened to them? They were arrested. Your thoughts on that? They were arrested for having, because when you do plan these uh, protests, you notify the police. You have a police permit, mm -hmm. and then you carry on this. Indeed. Uh, if they did have police permit, then it would not make sense to me why they were arrested. Mm. And they did. They okay, did. that probably that means they didn't get a police. They were, no, they, they, did, they, they did have the. They had a know, police permit to be able to go out there to do that. Them. Yes, they were arrested. The police claims that there were excesses during the protest, and that's why they needed to be arrested. Some of them, uh, all of them, have been arraigned. Some of them released. Yeah. Um, if the young people, but if the young people were only protesting now, I said they're a little bit kind of late. Hmm. This this thing has been this thing has been going for 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 a long time. I mean, elsewhere, kids have left their classroom and put their studies online to just make the point to their governments. Anyway, better better, <laughs> better late, late than, than never. <laughs> okay, so if if it's happening here now that people are telling their government this. I don't, I, I don't want to disclose certain things, but I've talked after, after, after the one on one conversation with, with some top people over, over this issue for a whole long time. Mm. Okay, and it's a, it's a thing of uh, you know, taking, taking, taking action. And at the end of the day, it's the wisdom of learning to move away from short term games and cultivate the culture of long term games. You know, this whole business, Kalam say, it's a short term vision. It corresponds to a short-term vision because you get it now, you said and whatever, and then and then and then, and then what? And then what means you leave behind some some Catholic nurse running some hospitals in some of these areas have come complaining about how children, you know, children like to jump into any stream and swim, mm. unsuspecting what chemicals could be in that water. Mm. And they report to the hospital with the ruptures, scrotum, and all of this, whatever. What did they do to the study to deserve Roger, Roger's courtroom? Mm -hmm. You know, because, because somebody, you know, when you had a former, whatever, professional miners, right. they have an assay dam, okay? They try to control the water. You know, all of this because I was born in a mine, right? Indeed. They have the assay dam to contain the water. Tapolin, that prevents water from seeping even into the ground. Mm -hmm. These ones, no, you oh, wash it in the stream, knowing that the stream would flow. Today here we are, we can't even stop giving out mining licenses. You, 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 you've traveled to Takradi before, uh, from Cape Coast? I, well, I, no, you I haven't. You used to? And when you got to be Poso, what did you used to find? People shell selling prawns along there, whatever. Mm -hmm. Go to be Poso now, it's dead. No prawns, rather there, the river, a smoky, whatever type of, a yellow, whatever type of thing. Indeed. The prawns who used to, they used to migrate from the sea, come and spawn in the river, whatever, go. That was that thing. It's dead. I mean, that's how, that's the thing that was behind 
this legislation that I mentioned mm -hmm. that was being prepared by Sweden, the church in Sweden, mm -hmm. ecocide law. Mm -hmm. We need something like that here. Sure, I mean, you're killing nature. Ecocide, you're killing, you're killing the ecology, you're killing nature. For what? For whatever? So, so Kwame Nkrumah's policy, yeah, go down and get it. You're not prevented from getting gold. Mm -hmm. But if an individual say, I don't have the resources to be able to whatever, come together, form a group, get the resources to mine gold properly. Indeed, indeed. For, th 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 there are those who have made the arguments that look, when we look at the gravity of the impact of illegal and unethical mining on our lives, you know, the existential threat it poses to us, mm -hmm. as against these protesters who, or these young people who were on the streets, hoping that their voices be heard. The police should be expending its resources on arresting people engaged in Galamse rather than no, the we young told, people. We, we, we told that the police said it to do that, to arrest the, stop the Galamse. That's, that's what I've read someplace, that uh, police and soldiers, whatever, sometimes be told and whatever. And actually, if interested, some, I'm not, I'm not, okay, I do not even know the name, so I cannot <laughs> mention the name. But I know, but I know uh, please also tell me that they're happier if they're assigned to go to those mining sites than to be assigned elsewhere. I see. Because going over there gives them access to getting some <laughs> gold, you know? So, so I mean, uh, you know, this is the term. Uh, it is true. It is true that our salary levels are low, mm -hmm. probably not the best. And everybody could use the extra penny or so that he can get. Right. And that is tempting and exposes people to wanting to, you know, do everything to get an extra whatever type of term. But at the same time, at the same time, you know, we need the education about ecological citizenship. This is this uh, thing we talk about. We need to, we need to, we need to develop a sense of ecological so that we are so belong closely to nature and everything that the concern and whatever thing for nature should be a thing that we should take seriously. You know, we need to educate ourselves to become ecological citizens. You know, I feel like, you know, uh, any, anything that can happen. Mm, I see. Your Eminence, uh, uh, you know, let's stay, stay away from Galamse for a little bit and then talk about uh, the elections. Mm. And I'll go <laughs> back to something that you have said today. Uh, that, you know, despite all the progress we have made in the practice of democracy and in conduct of elections, there's a lot of mistrust. 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 Why do you think that is the case? Mistrust in, I think, I think, okay, in, the, so in the, the electoral process. Yeah, so, so the, the <clears throat> one or two of those who introduced uh, the argument, you know, mm -hmm. I talked about that. There's a, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mistrust. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if I understood the points they made clearly, it's a, it's a mistrust based on the fact that if, um, if I'm not behind the appointment of a, of a, of a, of a, of a candidate, right. then, you know, the candidate cannot have my interest at heart. What do you think about that? So that's why I gave the example that I have been in a position like that. We were, as a, you know, as a, the first instance of National Peace Council in the times of President Kufuor, you know, we were named by, you know, somebody has to take the initiative, so he did, and formed the National Peace Council and named us. But the moment we, the first few minutes meetings we organized, we realized uh, the, the gravity mm -hmm. of the task before us, and the indispensable nature of uh, the you know of 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 uh, neutrality, not being able to you know, not, you know people not being able to identify opinions to any party, and quickly we fashion for ourselves that image. Okay, in recognizing that without that it was going to be difficult for us to work. So somebody can you know initiate something, and whatever he initiates does not become kind of a a baby in its pocket, right. that it can manipulate at will. But, but, so, but where the Electoral Commission is today, is, does it have the ability to uh, do that? Every human being is free. 
every the one the one the one attribute that we all have as people is our dignity and our freedom. So in, in, in the exercise of one's freedom, one is guided by ethical principles or his moral sense. So if he's a, a person of religion, then also his faith, his or her faith. So one can always in freedom decide what is right to do. So yes, one is annulled, but that, but that doesn't mean you become a slave mm. to whatever type of thing. You are you, you elected and put in a position. You need to recognize the position you occupy what that position requires of you and try to comport yourself accordingly. Mm, right. One, it's just one, something that I know. We've done it before. Indeed. And one argument that was made about that is the fact that, look, um, it would appear that because the position of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission is by appointment, yeah. and every government that comes for, for some time now wants to choose his own electoral commission. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we should change the way. So that's why, that's, that's why my observation was that if this is enshrined in the constitution, and if it's the constitution that determines or that you know, uh, prescribes this passage or this way for choosing the commission, then we should not look at the issue at this surface level, but look at where it's all coming from. Then this probably means that we should embark on constitutional reform and to, but it would be great. It would be great in, in the two cases I know of. Mm -hmm. In a, in a, in a, if I'm not mistaken, Zambia and South Africa, the choice of some such or Kenya, the choice of such person goes through a process. It goes to pay, pay, people come up with suggestions, names, and then the names are filtered and goes to parliament, and it comes to a president. So it's not the president's direct choice. It's the president's you know, uh, choice of possibilities that are offered to him or her mm. from the different whatever. That kind of, that kind of you know, changes the image of this figure. Okay. That in a way it's like somebody that they themselves had proposed or come up with. Sh should we consider you know, it's a, it's a, a different possibility. process? I mean, it's a possibility. It's something, I mean, if this is really a problem, and when you're looking for solutions, then we can try some other options that others have tried. Mm. There's nothing that prevents us from doing that. You learn from best practices. Right. Yeah. Indeed. As we you know, head into the elections, and one of the uh, you know, reasons we have gathered here today mm. is because of you know, the perception or belief that violence is, is in the rear for us or in the future ahead for us, uh, you know, as a people. Are these threats real, real or just perceived? No, I think, I think from the presentation of the chairman of IDEC, uh, which in a way was kind of collaborated by the Peace Council, the, the chair, the lady who chaired the event from the Peace Council, it appears as if, you know, they're not just shouting in the dark. Okay, but they, they probably, you know, have a, they have reason to be, mm -hmm. be apprehensive you know, about whatever type of thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, no, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of, uh, see, I went through this before. When I was with National Peace Council, at one elections, uh, one party attacked the supporters. This is way after the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, the voting has been done. Yet in Awo Oshi, a group was attacked, and we had to, for National Peace Council then, we had to visit them in the headquarters of the other party to kind of bring them solace and help and whatever type of thing. So, so that is the violence. That's the violence and, you know, just physical, whatever, and whatever. Those days already, there were matches involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now it looks like what they're telling me is that there are guns now also involved. And, uh, and uh, people are saying that uh, right now in East Lagos, there was a run-up for one parliamentarian died, right? In East Lagos? Uh, yes. Somebody, yes. There was a run-up or something. Yes. The and, and so, and so, that was, you know, so I'm, take, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm being told that upon clear evidence that you know, some... some, some uh, the, some weapons, the use of weapons were involved Absolutely. and organized and all of that mm -hmm. and that. So this is the type of, I mean, the proverb we have says that if you live in a glass house, don't toy with throwing stones, okay? Uh, the Francis will say, it's a fear, they man, don't be back. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. If you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. It just means that, you know, the question is that you break your glass house and all of that. That is the that is a proverb whose wisdom should guide us. See, violence. Everybody is capable of violence. It's almost like a virus, you know. Everybody can imbibe it. And there's nobody who's not capable of violence. Mm. So don't attract it. Mm -hmm. Don't act as if you, you have the prerogative and the only one who can be violent. It's not true. Indeed. It's a question of what weapons you use. Believing that somebody cannot have access to far superior or whatever. So in, for me, the thing about violence should not have anything to do with the uh, politics or uh, elections, basically because that's what I said at the beginning. Parties who go along that path give the impression that it is they who must constitute the government. And that's what I say is the falsity. Parties should not or do not constitute government. People choose governments. The advert that the EC has put on the television, which I saw last night, it's, it's an education advert, which says that it is at the polling stations that people elect their government. Polling stations, and this is done by people, not by a party. Mm -hmm. So for a party to think that it must do everything to whatever, no. The task and the function of a party is to convince and sell your ideas to the electorate so that the electorate would vote for you. But, I mean, do, do you get the impression that the Ghanaian electorate allows itself to wield that power? To wield what? To, to wield the power of knowing that I make the choice, not the politician. Sure. I mean, no, then don't call it democracy. Or if you call it democracy, then explain that to your electorate. No, but, but it would appear that, the, you know, the, the impression is See, that voters uh, yeah. have not come to that realization. No, it, 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 it is that... The lack of education is giving people the impression that politicians or those whatever type of thing, you know, they, 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 you know uh, that people are beholden to politicians mm -hmm. as if they have the power, they have the money, without recognizing or realizing that it is they who give them the power. This is a representative democracy, right? A representative democracy means the politician represents his community. So it's the community that invests power in this candidate. Mm -hmm. But that vision is lost sight of, giving the impression that a politician gets some money to distribute gifts and gain a campaign and get himself elected. That's not it. Mm. People have bought our democratic power to use it and to so in a way then this becomes a structure where we becoming enslaved to a system for which we need to live, from which we need to liberate ourselves. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's enslaving for, for a group of people to live under the fact that politicians are the ones, you know, who, who do them favor, mm. you know, who, but uh, what kind of favor? The right. favor, the money is your taxes. The money, whatever, what kind of favor? So we need a lot of education in that sense. I, indeed we do. Um, 32 years of practicing this democracy, mm. you say that our institutions or democratic institutions for that matter, should serve us. What's your assessment? Have we been served well? Oh, probably said not served at all. <laughs> oh, probably not served at all. But this is the thing though, this is the thing. I mean, in the, you know, you hear, you hear bandied around several times the expression servant leadership. Gee. Sometimes that makes me sick a little bit. Servant leadership. Do people really understand what servant leadership is? And, and you hear people in high places say, you know, I will be a servant leadership. Servant leadership, can you be like Pope Francis, kiss feet of people who are fighting? That's to be a servant leadership. Wash feet of people. You want to stop in a V8 and whatever type of thing, have cars move away when you pass. That's no servant leadership. Okay, Jesus at one point said in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the gospel, the difference, you know, for his uh, disciples, the difference between exercise of power. They dominate. Uh, they, 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 they exercise whatever. This is not. You know, the thing about leadership, uh, I'm not an ideal one, although I try to live it, because when I was a bishop, it was a leadership position. As a prefect of an office in the Vatican, it was a leadership position. 
now as a chancellor, it's again another leadership position. So I'm challenged daily with how I live this leadership. Okay, and you leave a leadership, somebody with some, some Irish guy who visited the office, went and sent me an email saying, when people visit you, they don't remember what you say. What they remember is how you receive them. And so that stays with them. Okay, and that, that was kind of how, how you receive them, that makes the impact. You know, on whatever time. So, I mean, uh, ideal thing, ideal thing would be, you know, if, if it's real servant leadership, it's two things. You need to be worthy of the trust of the people who make you their representative. And it's up to politicians to ask themselves whether they merit the trust of the people who have made them their representative. Because this is representative democracy. So every politician represents a community. And it's good every now and then to ask themselves whether they merit the trust of their community. Whether they even know their community. I'm saying this because this is something I say to priests. You priest, you are a pastor. You know your flock. Do you whatever tend to marry their trust? It's the same. Every leadership, is, especially when it's representative leadership, you need to ensure that you enjoy the trust of the people who accept you as their leader. If you don't enjoy their trust, you might find, well find a way to go. What are the deficits that you find in our lifespan as a fourth a, you know, uh, republic, so to mm -hmm. speak. What are the deficits that you see in our lifespan as a country? For the republic, uh, whatever, uh, I, I, I'm not a critic, and I don't want to be what the English people say, captious, huh? fault finding. Mm. Okay, that's, that's, that's not my task to be fault finding. I like, however, to improve upon things. Improving upon things is like identifying where things can be made better. So if I make observations, it's not out of the desire to be fault finding. It's out of the desire to improve upon things, whatever. Because this has been my basic position. Wherever I've gone, I think the thing is, you should not leave any situation the way you found it. You, must, you need to ensure that you leave a situation better than when you found it. And this has been a thing that has accompanied me all these years, wherever, wherever, wherever I've gone. Therefore, I mean, you get into a position. You need to first understand how you got to that position. And now when it comes to this, again, hearsay that, you know, for elections coming, the people go to juju, they go whatever time to be elected or not. I, I have no evidence of anything like that, whatever. But let's say somebody is elected by a constituency, whether it's because a lot of gifts were given or whatever. A small niece of my young professor tried to run for whatever office and realized that it's a wild area to go into. Mm -hmm. She goes on campaign, but then if he's speaking, all his ties are flat. So somebody comes to ensure that she cannot move from there to the other next village. Right. So it's, it's a, it becomes a dirty business. This is not something that you do out of law. This is something that you do because you've identified the other person as an enemy. Hostile because it's blocking you from getting to some uh, point which has some gains that, that, that you think you must get to. Mm -hmm. So plutocratic tendencies badly influence our politics. The quest for money. Somebody told me, I've, I've tried to look for it, I've not found it. Somebody told me about the research that was done with some university students, mm -hmm. asking them what they want to do. Okay, I, I am reluctant to, uh, to refer to it online since I've not been able to see to, to verify it. whatever type That's of But fair. the interest is that people want to be politicians or pastors. That's where money making is easy and cheap. Mm. Then, then, then we're going nowhere. You know, we get, we be consumed by plutocratic zeals and tendencies and stuff like that. And that does not lead to this servant leadership we talk about. As we head into the elections, uh, there have been a lot of calls for peace. 
But are those, and I, you know, I make reference to the IOS West Wagon uh, event that you mentioned mm. at, at the Techiman 8 who also mm. passed away in the 2020 elections. There are those who have said that there cannot be peace without justice. Mm -hmm. Your take on that? That is true. Even the Bible says that. <laughs> justice and peace must work together. You cannot have the one without the other. So what is it? <clears throat> uh, what is justice? For me, justice is a relationship term. Okay? It's a, when, when it's a relationship term means that to be just means to respect the demands of the relationship in which one stands. If you respect the demands of the relation in which you stand, that's your justice. Okay, and that's every, every, everywhere. So in this case, we're talking about politics. Somebody elected. By reason of the election, there is a relationship that is established between him and the electorate. That's a relationship. To respect the demands of that relationship mm -hmm. is your justice. If you overlook, abuse, or disregard the demands of that relationship, that's your injustice. Mm -hmm. You're not just in that sense. So, so when that is not the when you do not demand to respect the demands of the relationship, the relationship suffers. That is the signal of the lack of peace. Peace is harmony, and harmony is based on mutual respect. And when there's that, when that respect is not there, it's difficult to realize peace. So. When people say that this is related with justice, I think they're thinking a lot more deeply about justice in this regard, as, as if you know there's something that must come to them, something that must accrue to them, which is not forthcoming. So they cheated, they deprived of things, and all of that. That's, that's their sense of justice. Mm -hmm. But again, the sense is that if somebody in authority knows that he stands in relationship with X and Y because they elected him, because they make him their president and all of that, then he is, he is obliged in justice to respond to the demands or exigencies of this relationship. So what does that mean? Provide schools, provide health care, whatever. So if you disregard that, then you are unjust. Mm -hmm. So that's how the two can easily be put together. Right. So, I mean, we know that uh, peace pacts have been very important to the electoral process from the very beginning. Uh, it has become, unfortunately, a thorny issue in this election because one party um, says that unless there's justice, you cannot call us for But you a peace know, pact. that's the point. That's the point. A peace is actually and essentially an attitude of the spirit, attitude of the heart. Peace is not something... That, you know, so you go to sign a paper. You sign a paper. So how does that correspond to how you feel deep within? If there's no correspondence between the signature on the paper and what you feel deep within, that, that, it's meaningless. So because, you know, it, it, to be at peace or to be peaceful with whatever, it's, it's an attitudinal change and an attitudinal relationship between you and the other. You accept the other. You accommodate the other, you, whatever. Now, this is not always commensurate with signing a paper with anything. So it just means that in doing all of this, we should go deeper mm. than simply appending our signature onto some formulas or whatever type of things that have been created. We need to record, you know, to be at peace with a person is to accept the person deep down within you. Consider them as a brother, as a neighbor, as whatever type of thing. Be at peace with a person. Mm. You sign a paper without being at peace within you with a person, it doesn't mean much. Because of that, there, have all, there are those who have called into question the effectiveness and the influence of the National Peace Council, a council you were the first, you know, head of. We try. Is it time for the Peace Council to close shop? No. It's not time to disband. <laughs> it is time. It is time to recognize the implications of, of what it means to be that council. And to recognize that, you know, something of the Peace Council, I hope I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, detracting and, you know, going whatever, something of the Peace Council is similar to how the church broke its peace. Okay? Not having an army or not having a police or forcing people to behave or act differently, what do you have? To help them, you only have the voice of persuasion. And if you're a believer, 
prayer that God touches the heart of somebody. But apart from that, what do you have? You have only words. And so when the Peace Council meets all of these guys and begins to talk with them, what really do they, what power do they have by that power of words? Mm. To seek to persuade, to seek to convince, and to engage, whatever. This, this is all the power that they have. Mm. You know? And, and, and that is why, and, and if, if, if it's just you know, seek to persuade and engage and all of that, then also you recognize your own vulnerability. Indeed. That you, you depend on, on their goodwill. If they don't accept what you're saying, you can go beyond that. Very well. I do want to talk also about uh, the young people who, you know, today are clamoring for revolution or movements like we've seen in Kenya and all that. What does it tell <laughs> you? Indeed. What does it tell you about the state of our country today? You know about fighting for a revolution like that in Kenya? Uh, yeah, they are. They are. To do what? So what do they want to Because do? they want change. They want things done better. Is that the way to go? So that's what a, does that's it tell a, that, you about the state of the so country? So that's what democracy is for. Mm -hmm. That's what you want to change. Choose the leaders you want. Who the fuck they change? Mm. Not those who come and like, you know, they do with the women in Cape Coast, and she has with 50 cities inside there, and they buy their vote. And you give it a gift, and they make you to swear on the gift that, you know, you vote for X and Y and not whatever. This is coercion. This is not the exercise of freedom. So, but this is what our poli poli politics has become. Politics of coercion, mm. not we the politics of freedom. Your Eminence, we appreciate you talking to us. Thank you so much. Anytime. God bless you all too. Indeed. And thank you so much for watching this special edition of Hot Issues. We've been talking to uh, His Eminence Cardinal uh, Peter Kojo Apia Texan. And we hope to come your way with another episode next week. This is Hot Issues, and I'm Kemini Amano. Bye bye.